Let us pray. Father, I thank you that we can be here this morning, gathered around your word. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, may you open our hearts and our minds for what you want to share this morning, Father. May our hearts be open to receive. May we be the good soil that receives the seed that produces life. And I pray, Holy Spirit, may you be the one that waters and bring growth so that, be, so that we can be more like Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, Heavenly Father, for everything you have done for us, that we can be gathered this morning in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So this morning, I want to share with you four truths to win at life. Now, when you hear this, you might ask, well, I don't even want to know four truths. Just tell me how to win at life. What does it mean to win at life in the first place? Well, if you ask a Christian, it will be to be more like Christ, to fulfill the call and the destiny that God gave you, that you are here for a reason. You did not just happen. But God has a will and a plan and a purpose with your life. And to win at life is to accomplish that. It's to the day that you enter heaven to hear the words, my good and faithful servant. That's how to win at life. But how do we even get there when you're not there? How do you get to a place where you can win at life if you don't know that God has a plan and a purpose for your life? Or you know it, but you don't know how to move a step forward. And maybe these four truths will help you. Because throughout my life, I will going to share, I'm going to share things that has helped me to move forward to a place where I can win at life, a.k.a. follow Christ. Because that's winning at life. You can't win at life if you don't follow Christ. If you ask a businessman, how do you win at life? Make as much money until you die and then leave the money here. Does that sound like winning? No. So there must be more to life. There is a place where we can win for the sake of the name at life. Like I'm going to win at go-karts later so we can win at life. Oh God, please let the sermon work out. <laughs> anyway, there are four truths and I'm just, just going to share it. Then I'm going to go into each and every one of them. You can't win with a bad attitude. You just can't. You don't win without sacrifice. No bruises, no story, no guts, no glory. And it ain't over until it's over. That's the four truths. Let's go into it. You can't win with a bad attitude. So many times people can have a little bit of an attitude and not even realize it because that's what we call self-justification. Because we live so self-centeredly that we think winning at life means I should win around every corner. I should win. I should succeed. But when we come to the Bible and we just observe what Jesus said about the way or the attitude, the be attitudes are there as well. I mean, that's the Sermon on the Mount. The be attitudes. Be like this. Be like this. We call them the be attitudes. So, but when we look at Philippians 2 verse 3 to 5, and I'm going to share some little bit of background about Philippians to help this cement in. But let's read Philippians 2, verse 3 to 5. And it says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Now, why would that even be needed to be written, written in the first place? Because sometimes we as humans, we do things out of selfish ambition. And we do sometimes things out of conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourself, because sometimes we don't do that. We count ourselves more significant than, than, than others. And... I don't even want to go into the depths of that and lose track, but let, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now, before we unpack this, let me just give some background. Because when you, when you study, when you read the letter to the Philippians, we are holding a mirror up to ourselves. Because... I remember Philippians as, what was that song? The joy of the Lord is my, no. That, joy is my yes, but there, yeah, there's a rhyme that we sang at um, church. Um, it's Afrikaans, so it's not going to make sense. But anyway, we are holding a mirror up for ourselves because it's this happy book. It's this book full of, be joyful. But when you read it, you find, oh Lord, please change my heart. But... Philippians' main theme is unity. 
Where there is no unity, there is no, there is, where there's no unity, there's disunity. So sometimes we can easily point the fingers to other people saying that they are the problem, but rarely do we point the finger to ourselves and say, well, maybe I'm the problem. Because sometimes we are the problem. Don't know if you don't like hearing it, but maybe don't do it now, but at home when you look at the mirror, maybe say, there's a big chance that I'm the problem. Because it's easy when you're in the shower, you have this argument with yourself, or is that just me? Whereas you, where you have this argument with another person about how you are, you are right. And then when you come to scripture, you're like, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe let me humble myself because I can be wrong. And allow God to deal with you. Our goal should be unity, but sometimes it is self-preservation with our focus only on ourselves. And we lose focus of where God is and who, we're, who we really are and why God put us in the situations or the circumstances that he's put us in in the first place. But maybe you are doing life and you are trying to win whichever way you think. But... Generally, people learn to cope in two ways. It's either fight or flight. Most psychology books comes down to you either have a fight response or a flight response. That's how we, that's how we grow up. That's how we are molded by society. But we can, where we, we can either manipulate the situation for our own benefit and make things happen that will work out for us, or we can withdraw and just exist and wait until the situation changes. So I don't know which one of that you identify with. Don't say it out loud. That's between you and God. But let's allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us as we study through the letter of Philippians. We're not going to study it now, but hopefully you'll go home and you'll, you'll go study Philippians there or just read through it. But when it comes to disunity, normally there are three ways that we live out disunity. Number one is self-centeredness. It's all about me. I'm the center. I'm, it's all about me. It's the unholy trinity, me, myself, and I. And then the lack of love for others. If you have a lack of love for others, it's going to be difficult to put them before yourself. And then thirdly, pride. And that is when we read Philippians or when we read this verse, it packs so much behind it that we don't see, but hopefully I'm going to bring it forward because it deals with pride. The Philippians who were in Caesarea Philippi, they were first of all... They were named after Alexander the Great's father. Now, if you don't know who Alexander the Great is, he was the guy that conquered the known world. And Philippi was named after his father. So they had Greek pride. We are the Greek city because we were named after one of the Greek greats. And they were also a Roman colony. But a little bit deeper than that, there's a saying that all roads lead to Rome. If you go to Rome, you'll definitely pass Philippi. And they had that pride. They were the first city on the, on the Ignatian Way. They were the first city on the Ignatian Way. That's pride. That causes them to, we are the city. Not, not only are we named after a Greek great, we, but we are the Roman city. And just to expand on the Ignatian Way, it's the main overland route connecting Rome with the east. This was the major trading route and... Um, it's a communication route. It brought economic pros prosperity to the city. Everyone would know about Philippi. They were also the first church in Europe. So not only did they have Greek pride and Roman pride, but they also have Christian pride. We are the first church leading through the year. If you want to go minister to them, you're definitely going to pass through us going to Europe. And Luke calls them the leading city in Acts sixteen twelve. But... That's just the background. So the Philippians, they had that. They were, they were a military base as well. So they had all the reason to be prideful. They had all the pride that there is. Now in their pridefulness, they come to Christ and now they have to deal with that pride. Maybe you had pride of status or whatever it might be before coming to Christ, but now you come to Christ and you realize the old me needs to go pass away the old me needs to die and we, we will get there but i believe that the answer to every relational problem is if we could understand what it means to pour out our lives out for others not for our own gain but really for theirs i believe the body of christ would explode throughout the world 
Having the mind of Christ is uh, making ourselves available to Him and in situations doing what He would do. You remember that bracelet? What would Jesus do? It's by living that out. What would Jesus have done? How would Jesus have handled the situation? How would He have spoken to this person? And then we can all go, oh, Lord, teach us to be more like You. Because most of the times that means doing things that are other-centered. That's where we have the opportunity to be like him, having his mind in situations, not choosing for our sake, but choosing for the sake of others. And that is ultimately for his sake. Putting others ahead of ourselves. Being others-centered rather than being self-centered. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but humility, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves even if they didn't grow up with the privilege or the opportunities that you grew up with. We can be open to learn from anyone and love everyone. And if Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 says, to put off your old self which belonged to your former manner of life and corrupt thought, um, sorry, uh, so, uh, so through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created of the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. How do I deal with, with a bad attitude? Be others centered. Be humble. Put off the old self. Number two, you don't win at life without sacrifices. There is going to be some sacrifices that we might need to make. And those sacrifices are normally things that keep us from getting to where God wants us to be. I remember back in the day, um, I used to do online gaming, like proper online gaming. I was not just your weekend keyboard warrior. I was a full-time online World of Warcraft player who happened to have a job which never worked out because that was more important. Anyway, I had to make some sacrifices. At one point, these weekly ranking systems, and one week I ranked fourth in the world, and that was like, oh, awesome, I made it. No, I didn't. But I, but I came to a point where I had to realize that this life I'm living is not going to put me in a place where God can use me at all. I can justify it and say, because I did try, maybe I can reach people online for Christ, Well, if I'm actively doing it, yes, but I wasn't actively doing it. I was just wasting hours and hours and hours. I played World of Warcraft probably competitively for three years. And in those three years, if you combine all the hours and put that into days that I was online, it comes to 414 days. That's 24 hours times 414 in three years. There was a sacrifice that I had to make. I had to make that sacrifice because if I never made that sacrifice, I would have never positioned myself into a place to be used by God. The sacrifice right there and then did not open a door for ministry immediately, but it positioned me to go into a direction where God could use me ultimately. Because while I was there, while I was not making that sacrifice, and God was convicting me, but I was just not listening. Until I realized I had to make a sacrifice. Because living that life, giving it all for a game, 414 days worth of hours in three years, that's a lot of hours. Wasting my life away for what? And I had to make a sacrifice. It was not the only sacrifice that I made, but it was one of many. But that was probably the sacrifice that started a snowball effect of positioning myself to a place where God could use me. Because the truth and the reality is, if we read Romans 3.25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, I'm going to read in a different translation, don't worry, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. 
God made the ultimate sacrifice by sending his son Jesus to die for me and you on the cross so that we can have life, that we can be forgiven, that we can be reunited with him. And that would have never happened if Jesus did not come to earth and die on the cross, taking our penalty on himself. They had the law, but the law could never, ever, ever, ever do what Jesus had done because Jesus was one sacrifice for all sin, for all eternity, done, paid for. There's no law that you have to do a um, um, subpigeon if you had this kind of sin and this kind of sacrifice if you did that kind of sin and a, and a yearly harvest sacrifice. None of that. Jesus gave it all once and for all. But to read in the Amplified, whom God displayed publicly before the eyes of the world as a life-giving sacrifice of atonement and reconciliation by his blood to be received through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness which demands punishment for sin because in his forbearance, his deliberate restraint, he passed over the sins previously committed for us. So the day you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, that sacrifice counts for you. I was speaking to someone yesterday and I was applying some uh, conversational evangelism with a guy who has read some theology, but I just asked him one question. What about evangelism? Because he held the view that you are either chosen by God or not chosen by God. And I thought, and I was saying, what does that mean about evangelism? If what you are saying is true, what do we do with God, with Jesus' command to go out and make disciples? And he contradicted himself. Hopefully later that night he laid awake in bed and realized that that's what was happening. But... I'm just trying to say that Jesus paid the price and the day you choose to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior is the day that that sacrifice, that forgiveness of sin counts for you. It's done for everyone, but you have to choose. There needs to be a response. Hebrews 13, 16 says, Do not neglect to do good and share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So there's another form of, not another form, but another dimension to sacrifice it's sacrificing what is keeping you from god for his glory and there's doing good and share what you have with others and those around you for such sacrifices are pleasing to god and number three no bruises no story no guts no glory as we go through life we most likely pick up some bruises I can just see on my one hand how many cuts and scars I have just from being Nathan's age. Well, a little bit older because I played with a scissor and there's an incision in my hand because of a scissor that went into my hand when I was six. But I'm saying that we, while we grow up, we pick up some scars, we pick up some bruises. And it's there, it happens. Sometimes by choice, sometimes not by choice. Sometimes life happens, sometimes we put ourselves into situations where we can get bruised and scarred and all these things. But if we don't go through those things and give it over to God so that it can be for His glory and that, that He can use that, it plays into winning at life. Because what happened to me when I was molested, it can either hold me back or I can speak up and allow God to be glorified. And he can use that to help others that, that went through the same. And I find that the more I share that story, the more people come out and say, I was there as well. I was there as well. Well, okay. Speaking of men who you would never think speak up, but because they see another man speak up, they go, well, yeah, that happened to me as well. So, okay. Do you know what happens when things are brought into the light? God deals with it. God deals with it. So if God can use my pain, if God can use my scars for his glory, I'm definitely winning at life. Because the reality is, whatever the setbacks is, whatever the bruise is, whatever the scar is, whatever happened to your life, it can be used for God's glory. When Joseph was thrown into prison, at the end of his life, when he saw his brothers, they were so afraid of their lives that they were going to die. Because now their father is dead, so surely now Joseph can take revenge. And he simply said to them, what you intended for evil, God meant for good. 
meaning the evil and the bad that happens to us, God can use it for his glory. He's not causing it so he can do something. He uses it so he can get the glory. And 1 Peter 5, verse um, so 10 to 11 says, And after you have suffered a little while, can you say a little while? After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who, call, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. After you have suffered a little while, whatever that bruise is, whatever that scar is, a little while. Because the God of all grace will himself restore confirm strengthen and establish you to him be the glory to him be the dominion forever and ever amen when you read something like will himself restore what does that mean is that a promise is that saying that god will do something so whatever that is that you are suffering a little while just know that christ will restore Confirm, strengthen, and establish you through that. A little while we can give over. Because no bruises, no story, no guts, no glory. So how do you win at life? You can't win with a bad attitude. You don't win without sacrifices. No bruises, no story, no guts, no glory. And number four, it ain't over until it's over. You win at life. By not having a bad attitude, make some sacrifices, no bruises, no story, no guts, no glory, and it ain't over until it's over. Can you, let's just go, go back to, to on the cross, when Jesus was on the cross, busy being crucified. Next to him, there were two criminals, or two people also being crucified. They had never been into a church, most likely. They never did anything towards the kingdom of God. And there they are on the cross. Jesus next to them. And the one asked, Remember me when you go to paradise. I'm paraphrasing a lot. And Jesus said to him, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. It ain't over until it's over. On the cross, it was his final moments of life. And there was an opportunity for him to meet Jesus, the King. Just, it ain't over until it's over. Any sports game that you watch, it's the end when the whistle blows. Until that whistle blows, until the day something happened that you wake up in heaven, Lord willing, it ain't over until it's over. While you are living and breathing, you can still get to where God is leading you. You can still fulfill the call that God has on your life. It ain't over until it's over. Don't give up. Whatever you are going through, today can be your first day of something new. Yesterday could have been your last day of something old. It's not over until it's over. Today can be your first day day even if it's your seventh first day with the same struggle today is your first day it's not over until it's over i can think of some addictions that took me a few first days until it was my last first day of that journey it ain't over until it's over we're reading Galatians 6 verse 9 to 10 and let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Many times we see that meme where the guy is digging and there's some diamond or whatever, there's a treasure. And the guy is digging and digging. And just before he gets to the treasure, the final blow, the final push, the final whatever, he turns away, discouraged, and he loses out. Don't give up. It's not over until it's over. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Not only those of the household of faith, but especially to those of the household of faith. It's not over until it's over. Don't give up. If you can promise, don't promise me anything. If you can promise yourself something this morning, just say, I will not give up. No matter how many first days it takes, one day you will wake up and that will be the last first day 
of your life. Because God will restore you. He will establish you. And then we come to the end, Romans 15, 13, that says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. He gives us everything we need. Everything we need to succeed and to win at life. It's just, how are we going to respond to this gift of life that we have been given? Are we going to say, thank you, Jesus? I know maybe I'm not where I'm supposed to be, but I show me and direct me. Teach me. Grow me. Show me your love that I can grow to be more like you, Jesus. Let us pray. Father, I thank you this morning that we can be before you and I thank you, Father, that you have our best interest at heart, Father. That whatever we are facing, whatever we are going through, may we find our hope in the God of all grace who will restore us, establish us for whatever we are suffering for a little while because there's eternity waiting. There's a plan and a purpose you have for us now in this life that is waiting, Father. And I just pray, Father, that you will come and do in each and every one of us this morning what you want to do this morning, Father. May we be set free. May the strongholds that keep us in our minds break this morning in the mighty name of Jesus, Father. I pray, may your Holy Spirit fill us in your mighty name. I just want to say, whatever you need from God in this moment, just in this moment between you and God, there's no one. Don't think about your neighbor. Don't think about whatever's going on at home or what happened yesterday or what's going to happen tomorrow. Just think in this moment. It's you and God. And if there's one thing that you can say to God, even if it's just, Lord, help. Oh, Lord, thank you. Oh, Lord, I need you. Whatever it is that you desperately need to say to God, just for yourself. You don't have to say it out loud. Just say, Lord, just say that thing. And whatever you need to hear from God this morning, just know that He loves you no matter what. There's hope and it's not over until it is over. God is not finished with you yet. They stole time. Don't be frustrated. Don't put yourself down. Don't discredit yourself. Don't rob the grace that God gave you because you feel you are not there where you might or you should be. Hebrews says, run this race with patience and endurance and have some patience with yourself. God is busy working. God is busy working. May this be your first new day. Amen.